complete our study. I've, I've been starting this topic and can never finish it because we run out of time every time. But I think this time we will do it. So today is part three. Actually, it's more than part three, but more like focusing on the call of Elisha uh, is our part three. And the title is coming to you this morning as a conclusion. Are you ready to answer his call? Because that's what the message is all about since the beginning. And we've been looking at the story of Elisha's call in 1 Kings chapter 19. That has a special message for all of us this morning. Because all of us are being called by God. Uh, and we looked at it. And one of the scriptures we looked at says, He saved us and He called us with a holy calling. He saved us and He called us with a holy calling. The us is us. That's very logical and easy to understand. Okay, who is us? Us, us. yes, very good. 100%, you pass. Graduation, <laughs> hallelujah. Okay, so this verse here, so just as a very quick review of the main text that we are looking at, Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. Elijah went over to him and threw his mantle across his shoulders and then walked away. So we saw that Elisha was busy plowing with a group of 12 yokes of oxen. Elijah didn't say a single word. But the, the power of that moment, of that divine moment, this encounter was really, really great. Elisha felt that God's presence in his life has changed from that time on. So immediately, the next, next slide, uh, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother and I will follow you. And Elijah answered, Go back again for what have I done to you? Think about what, I just, what just happened here. So Elisha returned back from him, went to his parents, came back, and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them. This is over. His job is past what he was accustomed to. His, his life is not going to go back to that. He's going to move on with God's plan. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the town people. They all ate. And then he went with Elijah as his assistant. From being a farmer, he is now called to be the prophet of God. And as you know, he's going to be called to be a prophet in one of the darkest times of his story. He's not promoted like to a, a higher salary, a better position, something cool, or the, the fashion or the trendy lifestyle. He's, he's called to something that is going to be very costly into his life, but he, he's, he's okay with that. And then in the last few sermons, and I encourage you to look at, especially last week, to, to, to see the background of what we are going to complete this morning. We discuss about the next, the next slide about the, the calling of God because many people are uh, find anxi anxiety or they're a bit confused when we talk about the word calling. What does that mean? Because we immediately associate the word calling with something to do. I must do something. I must be busy uh, in accomplishing some achievement or something. And we looked at last week uh, and we corrected some of the understanding of calling. That first of all, the word call, we should think that we are going not to do for God, but God calls us to himself. It's a call uh, to God. It's not a call to do something for God, first of all. It's a call to to God. And we see that uh, in the New Testament 39 times the word call or calling is used as for salvation, call to fellowship, call to Him uh, through the gospel message. God is interested in you before what He's going to do through you. He's, 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 done, he's proven it. Bef when we were yet sinners, Good for nothing, unworthy. He died on the cross for us. That's how uh, interested he is in our lives. So, so that's for you. He calls you for you, for your well-being, for your eternal salvation. Because he knows that if you don't answer his call, you're going to hell. Because of, of the, the sinfulness in this world, the sinfulness that you inherited, the sinfulness that you, you, you we were born with, it needs to be removed. The, the Lamb of God has come 
to take away the sin of the world, to remove it, to, to correct it, to make you a new creation. The, the 1 Corinthians 15 says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Our body, our mortal body, as it is our sinful nature, is not ready, not able, not uh, suitable to live uh, for eternity and the kingdom of heaven. It needs to go through a transformation. That's why it says at the sound of the trumpet, you, our body will be transformed. And then we will go and be made fit to live in, in the different uh, world that God is recreating at the end of all times. So before that, he came first for salvation to us. So it's the first call is a call to know God. That's what it means to be called by God, the call of God. The, the, the main emphasis in the New Testament is called to know Him, called to be saved by Him, called to answer His calling for salvation. And the second calling, we find it at least 20 times in the New Testament, is a call to live for Him, live through Him, live uh, with Him. To, to walk with Him, to, to live our life, that every aspect of our life is live for Him, for, uh, with His help, with His presence, with Him in mind, with His interests in our, in our heart, with the motives that are being purified by His heart that is being developed in us. When we are born again, we cannot be called by God unless we are first born again, so that we have received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the one that will do the, the process of us understanding more specifically what God is calling us to do. But before He's calling us to do something, He has a lot of work to do. First of all, He has to clean. Clean our mess. Clean our worldly uh, viewpoint and clean the old traditions of our life. Clean from the past. That's why it says if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Everything of the past is past, is finished, is dead. You are now a new creation. You start a new life again. I remember when I received Jesus Christ, that's the message that clicked. Because I was trying to change my life for many, many years. I've been in the, the drugs and crimes and messed up teenager and young adults for, for nine years. I lived in darkness. But many times I was so discouraged about myself and I wanted to clean up my act and my you know, change or something, but I was not able to, to do it by myself. So that one night when I was invited, not really knowing that I was going to a Christian meeting, but invited to see a movie, which finally was a, a, big, a big thing. And you know what? I didn't like it. I didn't like the music. I didn't like the place, I didn't like the building, I didn't like their look, I didn't like their, their, what they looked like, I didn't like their songs, I didn't like anything. <laughs> but the power of the Holy Spirit spoke to me so, so strongly, that's the night I was born again. So I know through that experience that I was not brought into the church or brought into the kingdom of God through, uh, you know, like modern, fashionable, likable uh, concept and things like uh, tricked into something because I didn't like anything of that. But when God, the Holy Spirit, spoke to me that night and the message was you must be born again. And then the, the very simple explanation that was given to me that night is like you can start a new life. And when, when I heard the, 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 the explanation of the preacher and the anointing that was on his life, it clicked. That's what I've been looking for. I didn't know I, I had been looking for that. You know, my, my method was to change cities, change province, change jobs, change, change something in my environment. I tried to change my life to make it better by changing my environment, but not the heart, and it never worked. For nine years, I was messed up kid, until that night when I heard, you must be born again, you can start a new life, I will make you change. And I said, Lord, now be the master of my life. That night, I started to hear him. So my calling started on that night when he called me. But one thing that I've realized also in the past, if I look back, at other times before that, God had been calling me uh, through different circumstances at times. But I did not hear. 
or did not understand that he was calling me at that time. It's only after I became born again, when I was uh, reminded of some event in the past, that I realized, oh yeah, wow, well, God has been you know, calling me so many times in the past. You know, one time I was with my, my girlfriend, this is my wife, we went on a trip, we borrowed a Volkswagen and we filled it with, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, it's not really defying for you, uh, with uh, drugs and alcohol and we went on the trip. And then we picked up hitchhikers. They were Christian. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that's not what we were looking for. So when we found out they were Christian, we tried to get rid of them. <laughs> so we lied to them and we told them, get out of the car. We're, we're stopping here. We're not continuing over there. So stop here. And then we took off. Shh, and then we ran away from them. And we got to a youth, a youth hostel because we were you know, going around. And at, in those years in Canada, they had many youth, youth hostels. For 50 cents, you could have a bed and a breakfast. So you cannot beat that. So, so we were just traveling like this. And then every night we would arrive there and get organized, and then these, these guys just showed up. <laughs> these Christians, they always showed up. They always reappeared everywhere. <laughs> so anyway, so that's one, one example. Another time, years, a few years later, I was in, in Calgary in Alberta, and I was in, you know, in one of these states without money and everything, nothing to do. So there were some like, Christian preacher. You call it Jesus, Jesus freak, we call them. And they were on the main street of uh, Calgary. This is a mall without uh, any cars. And uh, if you would listen to him, then he would give you a dollar. <laughs> so I remember every morning <laughs> I would go there and listen and then he was, he was preaching the gospel, but I never heard anything. I just waited for my dollar. <laughs> That's all. And then I would go and buy coffee and a, a few muffins. Another time I came downtown Vancouver from a bus from the countryside, just downtown Vancouver, and then this young lady just in front of me, Jesus loves you. And we spent the weekend together, but she was not really like a, a true Christian, but she was in a cult like a false teaching, but she was talking about Jesus anyway. Anyway, I'm saying all of this that before I was really, I answered the call to be born again. God had been searching for me, has been sending people to me, and has been knocking at the door of my heart, but I was not opening the door. And that's the tragedy of many of us today. We hear the voice, but because we hear so many voices, we hear the voice of the world that contradicts the Bible. We feel the voice of atheists that says there is no God. So of course, if there is no God, you will not hear the voice of a God calling you. So there is a, the, a people who are very aggressive against religion. If you want to find people aggressive against religion, go to any university in the social science department. I, I, I organized a, um, a debate on the existence of God at the University of Montreal year, years ago. And I went to all the departments to find the most enraged people against Christianity to take the side of there is no God. And you know what? In one month I could not find any. Oh, I find a lot of people criticizing Christianity. But not one of them. I'm saying that, that in truthfulness. I met with the dean of the philosophy department. I met with the teachers the most. I was asking the students in the cafeteria, can you indicate to me the most aggressive teachers in social science against Christianity, in politics, science, history? And then they would give me the name of the teachers. I went to them. I says, I want to organize a, a debate so you, you would take the side of anti-Christian. He says, no, I don't want to do that. No one. In one month, I knocked at the door. Week after week, I went everywhere at the University of Montreal. Not one of them, not one of them came. So anyway, God calls us and he searched for us, but we must answer the call. First of all, it's a call to go to him. Amen? Amen. Yeah.
And then the second call is fellowship, is holiness, is to live a worthy life. And this, this comes more than 20, years, uh, 20 times in the New Testament. And then if you look at this definition, that's the definition we looked at la last week. And I want to uh, bring this, this slide here before we move on because I think this is very important and a very good de de definitions of what the calling of God is. Calling is the deep conviction that God calls us to himself so decisively. It's, it's a very, very strong conviction and very decisive. It's, it's life changing. It's a pure transformation. When you receive that kind of call, it will change your life. Your, 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 the way you live, it will affect you. So that, and I put the, the three points here because this is, the, this is what will be impacted when God will call you. Everything we are, our educations, our background, our traditions, our cultures, or whatever it is, our relationship, everything we do, our conduct, our work, or whatever it is, everything we have, our possessions. So the, the deep conviction that God is calling us so distinctly, uh, decisively, will affect everything in our life so that these three things, everything we are, everything we do, everything we have, will be now invested and lived out in a totally different way from before, with devotion as a response. And now, now that we have been called, we respond in a very, very, very unique way. That is, I think, a very good definition of, of the calling of God. And the, the remarkable thing is that we all have received this kind of call. But sometimes we don't realize that this is that important. And many, many, some of you are not really living out the call. Like Pastor Jennifer preached a few months ago, to live a life worthy of the calling. So here, look at that. And then think about, am I living a life that is worthy? Am I living that? Is that, is that describing me? Uh, my, the, the, the fact that I realize that God has called me from sin, from darkness, from death and from future judgment to himself for salvation because he loves me so much, the fact that I know that and that I have inside it, am I living in this way? Is, is that, am I decided, am I devoted? Is that the way I live? So I, I want to challenge you this morning because that's what the call of God should be affecting you in a similar way. Each Christian is called to witness and to work for the Lord because this is what will be the natural outflow of the call of God this morning. Amen? amen. Hallelujah. This side is more amen than that side. <laughs> so we will try to uh, speak to you more on, on, the, on, the next, on the next slide. Next slide. Okay. We have been for two weeks speaking about this. The first week we talked about these three points and then Last week, we, we reviewed this and added a lot of uh, information about the calling of God. So we, we touched these ones. Elisha was not a student from the school of prophets. He was a farmer when he was called. Uh, when Elijah threw his mantle upon Elisha's shoulder and says, think about what I did to you, his call became very clear and confirmed. He entered God's service only when he was sure that God called him. Not before, he was plowing the field, he did whatever. And we gave a lot of information about that last, last week. We mentioned one thing that concerns all of us today. We said, because sometimes we confuse our, our job, or, or sometimes our participation or our engagement into an organization that does things for society. It could be a, a ministry, a, a type of a ministry, serving the poor, uh, helping the needy. And sometimes we confuse the call with our job. And we said our job is not our calling, but our job can be uh, entwined with our calling. It can be a, a tool or used to fulfill our calling, but the, the calling itself is deeper than that, is deeper than that, because jobs and careers change, we move to other cities, we change jobs and we change orientation in our life, we, we go into retirement sometimes. So, so it, it, our calling 
is to know God, to live for God, to serve God. This calling stays with us until the day we die. So it's more than our job or a certain type of activity. But one question that we were asked to consider, in your present job, whatever it is, entwined with your calling or just a job to make money in your pocket and pay for your rent, uh, are you doing your job as unto him? So th that's important because that question answer what calling is. Are you being called by God? Yes. Are you called to live for God? Yes. We saw the definition there. So are you doing your present job as unto the Lord? And the answer should be yes. yes, yes. Even though sometimes it's no, but it should be yes. Okay. Are you are you punctual? Are you conscientious? Are you respectful? Are you cooperative? Ah, yes. Uh, yes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Are you lazy? Are you undisciplined? Are you, you know, neglecting, careless, or whatever it is? This should be reflect in the fact that we are called. We are called. We are called to God. Hallelujah. You know, our, our life, I remember uh, when I came at the beginning as a missionary to Hong Kong, there was uh, this young missionary called to go to China from Singapore. And he visited us and he encouraged us a lot. And he was telling us that... Uh, because sometimes young, young, young missionaries, we, we think that we're going to make the big impact. I'm going to China. I'm going to, you know, save the whole country because I'm coming now. God's calling me. And then uh, he was telling us that uh, the, the reality of us going to China is more that God the Holy Spirit will change us much more than we will be changing the country or whatever they got and that we were in the school of ministry that we were in the school of the Holy Spirit so see your life like this that you and I even me I, I'm, I'm a pastor I've been a pastor for many years actually I was thinking this morning during the songs Pastor Jennifer and I on October 1 will be 20 years that we are co-pastors and lighthouse October 1 we should celebrate that yeah we should celebrate that Hallelujah. Yeah. We survived. <laughs> she, we never kill each other. Yeah. Maybe we thought about it sometimes, but we never, we never said it. We never said it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. So see yourself as, uh, as you are in the school of the Holy Spirit. That's a good place to see, okay, who am I? Why am I here? What am I doing? What should be my attitude? Uh, am I tired of serving? People are abusing me. Doesn't matter. At the end, it doesn't matter if you ask that question and if you, if you see yourself in that, I'm being trained by the Holy Spirit. If, if you think in this way, you can take a lot of offenses. You can turn the page and forgive a lot of people, whatever happens. You can renew your strength, your energy, your vision, and your desires. You can do a lot of things that, that if you don't see your life like this, you will be angry, you will be frustrated, you will be offended, you will quit, you will stop, you will cut, criticize, you will walk away. Like many people are doing that, many Christians, unfortunately. But if you see your life as being called by God and that you are uh, in the school of ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, years ago, we were invited to go to a school of ministry in the Bronx in New York City to, to, to do in the darkest place of the Bronx. And we were doing music, we were giving gospel tracts, and wow, that was really impressive. So, so see your life as you are in the, in the school of the Holy Spirit. So, and make the most of that training. It means you are in constant challenge, being challenged to change, to grow, to mature, to do more. Because that's, that's what the school is about. The training of the Holy Spirit will always bring you higher, further, make you stronger, clearer mind, and the purest desire. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do, and that's what He's calling you to do. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wow. Are we going to finish our sermon today? <laughs> okay. Let's move on to the next slide. We, we, we saw that we saw that uh, last week, so I'm not going to go back to... So I was so encouraged this morning. 
someone who was on vacation this summer told me, I've been listening to your sermon on YouTube every week. Hey, well, I feel so good. So, 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 <laughs> so she, she, saw, she saw this one. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Now we're going to finish. Okay, maybe. He was called to a difficult work. Elisha was called to a difficult work. He knew very well the moral and spiritual condition of the people. He knew Elijah. He knew Elijah and the 400 prophets, the evil Queen Jezebel and the most uh, evil King Ahab. And all of these times was the darkest time of history. So when he was called, he was, as I said, he was not called to an easy life, to an easy time, to a cool time. To, it was not a promotion. It was a big challenge, and he knew he would face opposition and hardship. And you know what? He served God faithfully for 55 to 60 years. That is something. That is something. He didn't look for excuse, but right away he offered a sacrifice and surrendered his life to the Lord. Last week we took a look at the impact of God's call on Saul of Tarsus, who became uh, Paul. And uh, we saw that, uh, we saw verse 15, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings as well as to the people of Israel. But we had not looked at verse 16. So let's look at verse 16. And I will show him how much he must be blessed and become prosperous and rich and no, suffer. So in the calling of God, sometimes, uh, things will not be so so easy. Um, it's a very powerful life transforming experience that Paul, Saul of Tarsus went through. His life completely changed from the time he was set apart for that task to bring the name, to carry the name, to stand for the name. If you look at the Greek words used and the calling of Paul, you will see very significant things. To bear the name, to carry the authority of the name to the nations before kings. He, was, he went before kings and instead of being promoted was thrown in prison. But he did it. He did it to the end. He did it to the end. Uh, Paul he later on speak to Timothy when he was in prison and 2 Timothy 1 8 but be partakers of the afflictions not of the glories and the easy life of the gospel according to the power of God who was who has saved us and called us with the holy calling early in the week I was listening to Facebook there was a, a pastor from Africa. I will not name names or the country even. Very, very popular. He has churches, big, 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 big churches, even in the U.S. is very, very, very important. And he was praying for the people. And his prayer is, I'm praying for you. And you will receive everything that you have asked for. You will be rich. You will be blessed. You will. That's all. And every time he would speak three or four words, the crowd would go, whoosh, whoosh, yeah, whoosh. and then I will pray for you. Whoosh. You will become rich. Whoosh. And I will pray that all your prayers will be given to you. Whoosh. And I think it was an electronic voice, actually, in the past, mi mixed with a real voice, because it was so identical. Every three or four words, it would speak, shh. And then that same day, I'm reading my personal devotion in the book of Jeremiah. I'm not going to forgive their sins. I'm going to send them an exile. I'm going to punish them because they have sinned against me. Said, oh, wow. God is not speaking the same kind of words that this pastor is promising. And then I turned my last reading on the day. It's John chapter 16. And they will kill you and they will chase you out of your synagogue. That's the first verse of John chapter 16. They will hate you because of me. And that's the word that Jesus is promising before he's going back to heaven. And then he, he's committing the task to his remaining disciples. He's just telling them, they will kill you. Do you want to, do you want to follow me? <laughs> yeah, anyway, I don't want to scare you, but uh, that's also part of the calling of God. Of the calling of God. I remember my, one of my pastors, I'm in the ministry today because... 
probably of him. Um, that was my second pastor, because my first pastor was 81 year old when I was saved. So he, he kind of retired after that. But uh, the, the second one was a former missionary in our province that was very strong, Catholic stronghold at the time. And uh, in those years, they would persecute the non-Catholic one, like the preachers. And uh, he was in the countryside in the north of Quebec, very remote place, like a uh, logging place to the, and, and the mining places. And they were very poor. They only had a, a bicycle to, to go from house to house. And then people would call to each other. They would get out on the balcony, go away, communists, go away, communists. And that's, that's how they were, they were being treated. They live on straw mattress in those years. You know, you see, you see, oh, Canada is a rich country, or oh, Canada is this like that, it's comfortable. But these missionaries didn't live the, the Canadian life. They lived the, the gospel life in a way. They were living not on a mattress like your mattress. They were living on straw. They were riding bicycles. They were threatened to be killed. And it was... I, I was a, a new believer and he saw the zeals and the desire that I had and many many times at, at the end of the day he would spend hours with me just to talk to me and encourage me but at the same time warning me about ministry. You know when I went to Sri Lanka recently, I want to show you the next slide uh, and some of the people that I met over there. Uh, we met uh, with these families that were persecuted uh, rejected and beaten uh, families. This couple here, uh, they went into a remote place and, and, and this small village where they plant teas, a tea, the silent tea, yeah. and they are the poorest in the country. They go to them and they find the, the widows, they find those who have nothing. And you know how they create a relationship with them? They go and work in the field. They go and work with the widows, sometimes for months. They will just work and help them financially to, by doing the work with them and making a, a human connection, a genuine life. I really care for you, I'm here, I'm doing the work with you, I'm helping you. And then when the, the Buddhist monk come to these families and says, send them out of the village, they cannot rent homes. They cannot go and uh, get water in the village well. They cannot send their children to school. They are really expelled from the village. They cannot buy the grocery store. They cannot do anything. They are being rejected, so they need to move to other village. So this couple, they persist in helping the poorest and the poorest. And they have to think of creative way. How can they maintain discipling and helping these new Christians to grow. So they have come up with some ideas. They send these new believers into other village to be trained into other village because they cannot be in that village anymore because society, Buddhist society has rejected them. This one here is a church, they call it church house, has been destroyed completely three times in, in, his, in his ministries. He has been beaten, he has been thrown to hospital before, and now this is his sister. She has just survived cancer and she is still in the ministry. But this man, at the moment that we met him, his wife was in the hospital. The Buddhist monk came to his house when he was somewhere else. They came to his uh, house, they had a meeting, and they threw oil in the house. They broke all the windows and they tried to uh, soil the, the house, like make it polluted so that they cannot use it anymore. And they threatened his life. And during the night, they attacked. He was not there. The wife uh, get out of bed, she cut her her feet and she was bleeding profusely and then she was in hospital so until now she's still in the hospital. This couple here were very well to do. They had uh, properties and some place, a good big church and a good uh, Christian environment. God called them to go to some other hard to reach place, uh, Muslim areas, Buddhist areas. So they left everything, their family said, don't go, uh, people would say, don't go, why are you going, you, you have young children. So their methods of reaching out is that they are very educated people, they are helping with mathematics and uh, English 
tutoring children. And many of these children, their parents are really, really messed up. And these children, when they have uh, troubles, uh, when there's fighting in the house, or some even sometimes the, the parents will die, they will call them. They have become the parents of all the, these, uh, these children. This uh, pastor that you don't see over here has been kicked out. They have moved 14 times in two years. Because of that persecution, they, they are forced out. The, the, the landlord says, I'm not renting to you anymore. And his wife is called the, the, weeping, or the we, weeping pastor's wife. Uh, you can understand that. So these people, when we were there during that week, they are renewing their commitment and answering the call of God, even though it's going to be tough. Uh, this one here was just, he told us during the testimony time that he was just ready to quit and go back into doing something like secular because he couldn't stand it anymore. But he renewed his commitment uh, with his wife. And the stories of uh, many of these people were like that. So throughout your life, God's calling will bring great challenges and sometimes distress and frustration. That comes with the package. Remember when uh, Peter says, Jesus, what will happen of us? We have given everything. We surrendered everything to follow you. And Jesus says, oh, very good. This is what happened to you. Anyone who has abandoned or forsaken house, parents, family, children, whatever it is, will receive 100 times more. Yay! I like that. With persecutions. Oh, okay. And eternal life and the life to come, which is yay again. So two yay and one down, okay? <laughs> so uh, the, the 100 time we like, the eternal life we like, and the persecutions we don't like, okay? <laughs> so would you accept to be called to a difficult work? That's up to you to answer. Don't answer me here this morning. How easy it is to reason to turn away. I don't have the qualifications. Maybe the sense of sacrifice is too great. Uh, or the most used one. It's not the right time. I still have time. It will never be the right time. If it's not the right time now, when God calls you now, it will never be the right time. Yeah. After I graduate, after I get married, after my children are grown up, after I retired, after I have that much money in my bank account, after this, after that, then I can answer the call. All right. I, I, I have to stop <laughs> because it's time. I have not finished, but Pastor Jennifer, you can continue next week if you want to. <laughs> I'll, I'll add another section because there's another part of the, the calling that I think will fit very much with, with this topic. Uh, you know, this is uh, First King chapter 19. First encounter between Elijah and Elisha. Just to give you a little preview of the next time. Uh, Elisha responded to God's call with wholehearted surrender. He immediately followed Elijah. And you know what happened immediately after that? For seven to eight years, you never hear about him. He was nowhere to be found. He was an assistant. He was not the prophet yet. He spent seven to uh, don't don't don't, sh don't show that one. Put a black screen, black screen. <laughs> I will keep it for last time. I'm just I'm just saying that from the time Elisha put his mantle on his shoulder and he left with Elijah, you never hear about him for seven to eight years. He was being equipped and trained for his ministry. Anyway. Come back next time and I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> and this is First King chapter 19. And then you don't see him until Second King chapter 2. So during all of these years, Elijah did a lot of things. And there were wars. The Assyrian invaded the land. And this king did this. And uh, Ahab and Israel murdered Naboth. And Elijah went to rebuke him, and then a lot of things happened. Then in Second King chapter two, you find the day when Elijah will be taken to heaven. 
So we'll bring this part and our message next time when we meet again. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So, the call of God has come to you. Are you living the call? Would you please?